2015 is ending, 2016 is starting, and everybody is coming up with new resolutions. The new resolution for January that NSDAPF has come up with is resolved on balance economic sanctions are reducing the threat Russia poses to Western interests. This is a very broad resolution that in many ways isn't actually about Russia or sanctions on Russia, but a lot of judges will think that it is. So really what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with two potential subsets of this resolution that could each potentially be months worth of debate, and what the big clash there is, then move on to the actual topic and what makes it so broad, and what that actually encourages Pro to do. So the first topic that a lot of judges will think of when they hear a team read the resolution is, are the current sanctions on Russia increasing or decreasing global stability? And again, that's a really big topic, and it's a small subset of this topic. When you're looking at it, you can look at, do sanctions provoke Russia? Do they reduce Russia's capacity? Do they reduce it enough to actually have a meaningful effect compared to what its capacity would be otherwise? Are the sanctions going to affect the right parts of Russia for that? Are they going to simply cause things to be shuttered away in ways that make this worse? This was a debate that happened a lot on the Ukraine topic that we had at Nationals a couple years back. And when you're looking at it, you're also just looking at generic arguments on why sanctions tend to fail, why sanctions tend to succeed, as well as Russia-specific versions of them. These become both questions of what are the nature and strength of these current sanctions, and what kind of past successes or failures have they had in terms of how they affected Putin, Medvedev, etc. So that's the first big topic. That's a subset of this topic. The second topic that a lot of lay judges will think of when they hear a team read the resolution is, do the economic harms to Western Europe and Eastern Europe outweigh the political benefits to Western Europe and North America of sanctioning Russia? And in this case, these sanctions definitely have economic effects and political effects. The political effects more benefit countries farther from Russia. The economic effects more harm countries closer to Russia or that trade more with Russia in the first place. So that can be kind of an economic harms versus political benefits debate that can be had in which part of it becomes what is the West on balance and which interests are more important and which countries comprise larger portions of Western interests than others or do these interests span national borders entirely. And again, this is a super broad topic for one of the reasons that the actual topic is, but still less broad than the actual topic. So let's go ahead now and do what we normally do first in these videos and delve into the actual wording of the topic. On balance, it's more straightforward for this resolution than it was for December's. We total up increases and decreases from the threat posed by sanctions. And we say, okay, there are this many increases to the threat, there are this many decreases, these ones are ongoing, therefore they count, therefore they can be weighed, and we kind of just work from there, take everything, bring it together, go ahead and say, how do these total up? It's not a resolution where on balance is really a trick phrase. It says economic sanctions rather than sanctions. So are we talking about trade or just economic policies? Is this distinct from fiscal or financial? Is it different from just being sanctioned? Why is the word economic included? And generally speaking, we're going to be looking at this probably in terms of sanctions that affect economic-related industries, because there's two interpretations. The first is the one I just mentioned, so mainly sanctions affecting banks, sanctions affecting bankers, sanctions affecting nationalized industries that deal with the flow of money. But the other broader way to interpret this is just as opposed to, like, verbal sanctions, sanctioning by saying, no, don't do that, to pass a resolution to sanction someone for their actions, rather than an actual type of recourse that has an economic impact. So you can define economic sanctions either way, depending on why you think economic belongs in the resolution. Next thing it says is, are reducing. So this resolution is written to be in the present and progressive. 
So sanctions that are currently having an effect. Potentially announced but not implemented sanctions could fall into this category as well. The contrast, this would be expired sanctions that still have lingering political effects. But we're not talking about whether the sanctions have been successful in the past or could become successful in the future. We're asking if the sanctions that are working right now are currently reducing the current threat that is being posed right now. Whatever that may be, and we'll get there in a moment. So, the threat Russia poses kind of has a tacit definition of the last two words. It presumes that Russia is a threat to Western interests. If Russia is not a threat, the resolution is not true, and Pro really cannot affirm. So we need to keep that in mind when we're looking at how this topic develops. Con teams have an easy way out if they want it with that, but that's more avoiding debate than engaging in debate, and there are plenty of ways that Con can win on any of the various cores of the topic. So the next question is, what are Western interests? And kind of that comes down to, where is Western? What is Western? When we talk about Western civilization, the Western world, is a question of geography, just in terms of anything to this side of the former USSR? Is it talking about just a question of Cold War affiliation, first world versus second world countries? Is it really just a question of non-Slavic white people everywhere? What do we actually mean by Western interests? Because the West is fungible. When people talk about in defense of Western interests, in defense of Western civilizations, they have a particular group with quantifiable values that they are talking about, even if they can't actually separate it out clearly. Russia is sometimes included in Western, sometimes not. It's pretty clearly not in this topic the way it is intended, though a team could argue that it is. When we're looking at Western interests, we're probably talking about things like global stability, we're probably talking about things like economic interconnectedness, more globalization, more credibility for the UN, more credibility for NATO. There are a lot of different things that can fall into Western interests, but generally speaking, once a team includes something, it's much harder to find evidence that says this is not a Western interest than this is. Because if you find something that says that this country is Western, this country is Western, these countries share this interest, even if somebody else has a definition that doesn't include it, that's not the same thing as a definition that says it should not be an interest, and here is why, but even if it did, that would not change that it is something they are interested in. So it's much easier to add an interest than it is to remove an interest, which means you have to weigh competing interests against each other, unless you're going to turn everything in the round. So those are the words of the resolution. It's super broad for a couple of reasons. The first reason has to do with sanctions. We're not talking about sanctions placed on Russia. We're not talking about sanctions placed by the West. Sanctions placed on Syria affect Russia, affect its threat to Western interests. Sanctions placed on Iran affect Russia, affect how it deals with Western interests. Sanctions by Russia on other countries can also be part of this topic. It's a really broad topic because it doesn't say who the sanctions are placed on or who the sanctions are placed by. And this gives both teams a huge amount of leeway to look for the highest magnitude things to weigh on balance as they can. Especially given the way that Russia's oil and LNG economy is related to Ukraine, is related to China, is related to Iran. The way that Iran's nuclear program is related to Russia. The way that Russia has a huge stake in what's going on in Syria. Sanctions on any of these countries can increase or decrease the threat Russia poses to Western interests, depending on where you think the most likely flashpoints are, or what you think is most likely to change the way Russia acts, or which threats you think are most easily affected by sanctions. So there's a ton of different stuff 
that can go into it just there. And the second reason that it's so broad is what we talked about briefly already in terms of what are West interests. Because every different interest you define can have a different kind of threat that can be posed, and the magnitudes of those threats are is mostly in question, though at the same time, we obviously should be talking about probability as well. So when we are looking at unbalanced economic sanctions or reducing the threat Russia poses to Western interests, we are looking at, well, England is sanctioning Syria, Syria is an ally of Russia's, this is a very small amount of the total sanctions, but it is one that is going to provoke this direct reaction from Russia, which will cause this conflict with Turkey, which will cause this situation to escalate, and that's the most likely threat to Western interests. All of your other sanctions that are bigger, that are more ongoing, are less likely to change the amount of imminent threat Russia poses. So that's an example of a way that something that sounds fairly obscure could get fairly big fairly quickly. Now I understand why the framers of the topic didn't want to say sanctions on Russia, because most of these sanctions are on Russian industries, or on Russian businessmen, or on Russian bank accounts, mainly on people who are close friends of Putin, to try and provoke a political reaction that is desired, to try and create pressure from within Russia, but that's still not limiting it to sanctions targeted towards Russia, or sanctions meant to influence Russian policy, which is what makes this so, so broad. That said, the majority of rounds in this are going to be about, are the current sanctions increasing or decreasing global stability, do they provoke Russia, or do they reduce Russia's capacity, and also just what are the economic effects of these sanctions going to be on Western interests compared to what are the political effects going to be on Western interests? And for every round that isn't about defining Western interests or defining the West, those are two fairly likely areas of clash, but there's still the large plurality of small situations of various obscure sanctions that can easily be tweaked to outweigh by a team that wants to card check another team and force them to debate something the other team isn't familiar with. There are a ton of different ways this topic can go, but generally speaking, pro has more predictable arguments and con has access to stronger turns. This means that unfortunately it is in pro's interest in a lot of different rounds to be a moving target, to constantly change what sanctions are talking about, what Western interests, what threat Russia poses, and keep moving around and never really let the debate settle down to somewhere where Khan can execute a strong turn and take advantage of more literature that they have on this. This means that unless Pro gets to speak second, Pro is probably going to try and mitigate as much of Khan's offense as possible early on by running a fairly non-committal broad case that can go in a bunch of different directions, and a lot of the rounds are going to be Khan chasing Pearl over the place going, no, let me turn this, and Pearl going, no, but have you considered this other thing that's also really important? And that's especially going to be egregious under CFL rules, where Pearl always speaks first and Khan always speaks second. If you are pro, you want to speak second on this topic. Not just because the pro side is a little bit weaker, but because the pro side gets a lot weaker if they don't know what the con side is going to say. You should have multiple cases you can run on pro, you should have multiple contentions you can run on pro, but at some point on pro you still do need to take a stand, you need to pick something and turn it, and try and stake the round on that and make it out with everything else, and you need to make the decision by your summary. So, Pro needs to be flexible, but Pro also needs to know these are the places where we can set a trap, these are the places where we can take a stand, this is where we want the round to stop that the con team is not ready for, and the con team needs to know when to pursue and when to say to the judge, look, they're just dropping stuff all over the place and trying to bring out other things they think outweigh, but the things that we've articulated in multiple speeches are more important, the things that they're just blipping can't really outweigh no matter how badly they overstate the impacts of how many times it's a global thermonuclear war. So focus on what we've been talking about. Look at what they're doing to not debate us. This is what we want to win on. Obviously, Khan and Second avoids that problem much more easily, but Khan and Second is in a pretty good place already. If you have follow-up questions about specific arguments from Blake, 
follow-up questions about specific arguments you want to run or are consider running or worrying teams will run, feel free to let me know in the comments and I will try and do a follow-up to this topic because it is a huge topic but I do not want to make a huge video. Thanks for watching and hope this helps. Let me know what else I can do for this topic.